Thank you. Welcome to our July 20th, 2017 business meeting. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, County Administrator Don Krupp to please take roll. And by the way, Commissioner Schrader is attending a meeting and will not be in attendance today. Well, good morning, uh, Commissioners. Uh, we are joined this morning uh, from County Council, Mr. Chris Story, and serving as our clerk of the board is Mary Rathke. So let me start with the roll. Commissioner Humberston? Here. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Commissioner Savas? Here. Chair Bernard? Here. And uh, in, in addition, Commissioner Schrader is actually at a, a National Association of Counties meeting where she is, I think, uh, chair or co-chair of a national committee. So that's uh, certainly a valuable. So please join us in a Pledge of Allegiance. I, every time I do that, I think there's no comma after. <laughs> and I actually have to think about, am I putting a comma in it? Anyway, uh, first up, we have citizen communication. And uh, we have three uh, folks who would like to come up and talk together. That's uh, Bobby uh, Paredes, Fallon Cracksberger, never heard that last name before, and Eleanor Hunter. Thank you for coming today. Tell us who you are and the general area of which you live. My name is Eleanor Hunter, and I live in Oak Grove. I'm Bobby Paredes, downtown Oak Grove. And my name is Fallon Cracksberger, and I live in Oak Grove. Great. Thank you for coming. So the three of us wanted to come up and bring you some good news. Sometimes people are always complaining. We wanted to let you know about the great Oak Grove Trolley Trail Fest that we held last Saturday, which is a booming success. So I wanted to introduce you both. Oh, and this is Hunter, by the by, over here. Hunter. So I just wanted to introduce you both to Bobby and Fallon. And so Bobby's going to tell you a little bit about her. I am the president of Harrison Properties, Inc. We are a commercial property owners, and we purchased two historic buildings on the south side of Oak Grove Boulevard two years ago. I have nine tenants, and these buildings are zone C3. They are storefronts, but behind the buildings is an 8,000-square-foot grassy backyard. All spaces have doors to the backyard. The building over the years has had trouble with vacancies, and when I took over the building, I tried to figure out how I can stop that. So I purchased the building because I thought it was a prime area for revitalization. My vision of our building is to be somewhat like Multnomah Village, very trendy, community-friendly gathering place. I envisioned a trendy coffee shop, a small brew pub, where I could have a backyard seating area with a small fenced dog area, fire pit, tables, and a children's area. Friends could meet, have a beer, one could have a latte, run their dogs, let their kids play, and meet up with their neighbors. I soon learned that the ordinances would not allow for those uses, and it mainly revolved around the parking ordinances. For every 1,000 square feet of space, I needed 15 parking spaces. I have two. So I needed help with the community to make my vision happen. I started attending Oak Grove Community Council meetings to meet the leaders of the community. I created Oak Grove Historic Trolley Trail Association in March of this year. It's a 501c3, a nonprofit, and I hand-selected the movers and the shakers of the community. I specifically picked the people I thought who could make things happen. And it took me a while to figure out who it was. Eleanor is one of them. <laughs> this is our mission statement for our association. We will strive to revitalize and establish positive social, economic, and community growth for all Oak Grove residents and businesses. When I started the, the first meeting, the room was full of leaders and they had many, many ideas. We started by planning a, a summer community event and we called it the Oak Grove Trolley Trail Fest. Within two months, we made it happen this last Saturday and it was a huge success. We partnered with the Oak Grove um, United Methodist Church, the medical office, Cranston's, and the new owner, owner of Safari Club, the Cash Box. These were all our neighbors and they let us use their properties for parking and, and, and such. We had kids games, food trucks at the church, vendor booths lining the streets, live music, and a beer garden. 
Hundreds of people came from the community and many of them walked from their homes. So it was a huge success. But we did it on a dime. We didn't have any money and we did it quick. Too late for corporate sponsors. I walked McLaughlin Avenue and I walked inside every small business and I asked for their support and I told them what we were doing. They were all very excited and some of them just gave me 20 bucks. They said, cash, this is all I can do. I'm like, thank you so much. So that's what we did to help fund it. A feed store donated straw bales for the seating and even the Clackamas County Department of Transportation traffic loaned us the road closure signs and all the cones. Sean over at traffic was awesome. He helped me load them. He put the signs up for me. He was great. Um, last week, the Clackamas County Engineering, uh, a, a gal over there, I can't remember her name, she reached out to our association asking for input about custom-made bike racks and place-making improvements to the trolley, trail to the trolley trail. They said they would work with us to find grants to fund the project, and they were asking our association, since they heard about us, um, uh, for our input on the design. So we'll be getting back to them soon. Um, I want to thank um, Sean over at Traffic, and I also want uh, to thank uh, Christian Snuffin over at the engineering department, who worked really hard to get the street closure permit for me. I wanted to close off downtown Oak Grove, the whole boulevard, but he couldn't make it happen. He says, Bobby, we're going to make this festival happen for you somehow. We will make it happen, and he did. So that was great. Um, we're just so excited to do more work and bring greater economic vitality to the area and engage with other county staff members. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This all started with a vision. Bobby pulled us together. We started meeting at the local brush and barrel in downtown Oak Grove. And uh, we came up with this crazy idea to have an event. We pulled this off in two and a half months. She did pull together the, movie, movie, the movers and shakers. Um, we asked our neighbors to uh, play music. We asked our neighbors to share their decorations to set up. We um, posted on Nextdoor for local vendors. We looked for local food vendors. This was Oak Grove. Oak Grove came together and they showed up. I have never been so proud to be a part of a community. My family and I moved to Oak Grove just a year ago and I was really missing a, a lack of community. I. Um, I love my neighborhood, but I just didn't see where the community was coming together and taking place. When I, my very first Oak Grove Community Council meeting, I met Bobby, and she asked me to join the Oak Grove Historic Trolley Trail Association. And since that day, I have been overjoyed, and I am looking forward to the future of working with these women and with the community. We are here to stay, and we will be making more of these events happen on an annual basis. And I wanna uh, echo what Bobby was saying. Thank you so much for the county support, and uh, be keep us on your radar, because we're gonna keep on doing this. And um, we want people to be proud of Oak Grove and happy that they're that they're a part of this community. Um, we did this with uh, no budget. We opened a bank account for the Oak Grove Historic Trolley Trail Association and we were willing to just foot the bill. But we did make um, a, a small profit from the vendors and from the sponsors with even leftover money to pay the, the clowns that came. We had a therapy pony, people. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jim, for showing up. We really appreciate your presence there. And uh, we look forward to seeing maybe the rest of you there next year. Thank you. And I wanted to particularly give a shout out to uh, the PGA, uh, Katie Wilson and Stacey Davenport, who came and had a booth there, person to booth. The great folks from NCPRD who uh, worked with the kids and worked with the church and coordinated with them for uh, fun for them. Sarah McClurg and her Neighborhood Livability uh, program got a number of shout outs. There's a specific mention on next door about how great that was and people really engaged. And uh, Rita Hale, who helped arrange for the, uh, the free recycling bins and stuff that were there. And Kelly and others at the uh, uh, Resource Conservation and Solid Waste Department. 
you guys were great. It was really fun. We had a great time. The, therapony, the therapy pony just like really put it all over the top. But again, we've got a 501c3 now. We can go for placemaking grants and other things. So just to let you all know how well everybody's working in the Oak Grove area. The Elks had a, had a booth there. The Bomber was there. The church, Vinyl Tap, I mean, we had it all, and it was really great. The main comment was, when are you doing it again? This has to become an annual event. Ken, did you want to say something? Did you say Spinal Tap? Vinyl Tap. Oh, okay. The bar Sounded like you said Spinal tap, tap, which I know is a pretty hardcore right. rock and roll group. Right. Well, it's Vinyl Tap, and that's the that idea. That would have been an right. interesting one. Right. It was great. It was really great. It was a lot of fun. And the church said that generally the parking lot was only about three quarters full, which to me means people walked. They had their dogs. They had their strollers. They had their kids. It was really a wonderful community event. So thank you both so much for coming. It was fun. Thank you, Paul. I was glad to see uh, everyone gathering, and the, the attendance was great. I was able to spend two of the four hours there, so um, it was it was fun. And um, and being a resident there for 32 years in the area, um, I will say that uh, sometimes some of the re local restaurants, some of them that are former restaurants uh, locally, Da Vinci's, I, I can remember, was yeah. a part of our. It was a place of community, actually. Every one of these places are. So we've lost some of those places where part of that fabric is now, you know, lost. But so things like this to add to that and build and repair, I think, and give more opportunities for us to network are great. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking forward to uh, the next time and maybe we ought to talk about uh, First Friday. There's a number of ideas going on. Jeff Hogan is the new owner of what used to be the Safari Club and he's been very generous. He let us use electricity both for the history detectives so that uh, Keith could run his little trains for the kids and everything and for all the musicians and stuff. So there's a really great, uh, there's a great overlap, you know, between this organization and MAPID and the community councils. So I just wanted you guys to introduce to meet Bobby and Fallon and know that we're having a great time. Thanks, well, thanks for coming by. Thanks so much. I, I just want to add, I uh, I thought it was a great event. I had, actually had to give up on getting food because the line was too long. Uh, so, but the, the, it wasn't all great. Chips was putting sparkles on people's face. Yeah, and yeah. Somebody uh, ran into, uh, looked like they had fallen and scraped their <laughs> cheeks because of chips. But uh, the little girl at the church had an incredible voice, if you happen to hear her. So the guy who did the, the kids' karaoke, I ran into him at Office Max, and he said, oh, are you at the church? What's going on? It's like, uh, sure. So it just became this whole network of the community falling into place. It was really wonderful. There's also a lot of resources available. Uh, Metro has, I think, some downtown grant money mm -hmm. that they're making available. I thought it was a lot that they were putting together, storefront improvements. Uh, and also, I... I uh, used to run a downtown association, Milwaukee Downtown Development Association. Um, and, uh, you know, th those associations, uh, statewide associations, have opportunities to grant money. And also our, the conferences, uh, which I've been to a couple, uh, one in Astoria was very valuable. Uh, give you a lot of ideas, bring some people down, have a good time, go to a conference. Uh, it's great. And that's actually how I got into politics. And you might know this guy, uh, Brad Olson, invited yeah. me to come to a Milwaukee Downtown Development meeting. I left. I was the president. <laughs> he got voluntold. I didn't huh? anyone yeah, else right. wanted it, <laughs> evidently. And was until uh, I became the mayor, so a number of years. And then uh, we started the farmer's market. And mm -hmm. what I think is most valuable about events like what you do is that a farmer's market, for example, I used to call it it's the Milwaukee's living room. So you have an opportunity to uh, not only talk about what's happening in your community, but meet people you didn't know or people you did know but have lost contact with. And that's how you build community back. And uh, I said, yeah, it'd be great if you did this once a week. Farmer's markets are very challenging to start and are expensive. And there's so many of them now, there are a few vendors left. Uh, to get there, so that's probably not the other thing. But you know, if you look at Happy Valley and the Pickathon, you yeah. know, which got yeah. some small funding from tourism and built on that, and it's it's world class now. Mm -hmm. um, those things start 
with an event like that and mm -hmm. grow to something different. But I would recommend not a first Friday, maybe a first Thursday or first Wednesday, because a lot of people are doing first Fridays. Uh, and, you know, it's easy to close off that street because there are a lot of other options. Right, that we can't close Oak Grove Boulevard. That we can't close. Yeah, but so, so there's a lot but the of other side streets. And well, one thing is that lot that's behind New Urban High School, the, the playing field, it's right next to the trolley trail. And so that idea of taking that fence down and working the way the school district and the parks district are now working better together to make that, that whole idea of having a living room. And that's really where's the, where's the place? Where's that, that, that space that we can have these, these things happen in? Yeah, so, and I also right. uh, ran Milwaukee Festival Days for right. uh, at least five years. And, and, you know, there's money raising opportunities, especially in carnivals. There's a lot of money made in carnivals, and Milwaukee lost out when the Waldorf School sold because we had no place to put the carnival anymore. Yeah, but, I mean, we used to get about twelve to $20,000 at a carnival. Yeah. The risk, of course, is that the weather's too hot or it's raining. But uh, the good years we had, it was pretty impressive what you got out of a carnival. Just, Anyway, be happy to help you talk. And I actually created the taxing mechanism that we taxed all the businesses mm. on based on square foot and first floor, second floor, uh, which worked really well for a while um, until uh, it, it depended uh, on uh, Dark Horse, actually. And at one point, Dark Horse, after I was gone, of course, determined that that tax payment was... was uh, really not a good investment and they took that out and then the whole thing collapsed but uh, the farmers market was started uh, with the downtown association and they were the seed money to get it really going so mm -hmm. all those things start somewhere and build community and become great ways to communicate and build relationships so exactly and it's all in accord with map it it's all in accord with all these things it's all building up so now that we have a 501c3 different avenues open up. Yeah, and I actually created the 501c3 so we could raise money, and that's the one of the best things we did. And it's still in existence. We better go. Thanks so much. Thanks so much Thanks. for your time. It's nice to see you guys. Thank you. Bring you some happy July. You know. let, let me know if you have a carnival. I grew up in the carnival oh, business. Yeah. I'd be happy to be there. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Les Poole. Good morning, Les. Good morning. I uh, lived in Oak Grove for 20 years and two days, and I live down the street in Gladstone. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk, commissioners. Um, and I do look forward to hearing back from Martha. Uh, it seems like the counties, uh, through necessity and, and through better communication, we've got easier ways to communicate. Um, the counties are working more. I see a little more synergy and, and the, the more time you spend not necessarily duplicating what other commissions are doing, but looking at what they're doing and what the outcomes are um, will really help. And I've attended a couple of NACO conferences just as a citizen, and uh, um, in a way like Oak Grove, it's the perfect <laughs> opportunity for anyone that's involved to, to get a handle on how things are working. That's probably how Paul caught wind of what was happening down in, in Lane County with the, the homeless solution. Um, and kudos to the folks for putting it together. I, I've been involved in things like that. And uh, what they just expressed to you was that it only takes a very small number of people to make anything happen. Tragically, that's how Hitler started. But on a positive note, that was a little grassroots effort, wasn't it? Didn't have much money. Yeah, we've been there and changed some things in the county the same way. And, and uh, so that, that, was, that was good to hear, and I wish him well. Um, and, and I would also say that that nice grassy area behind her business, nice area that she wants to do something with, there used to be a real problem in the neighborhood, and that was the big old white two-story farmhouse that sat right there with all those little businesses in front of it. And uh, it was quite stirring when I came home for lunch one day and that thing was on fire. 
Um, but, you know, in the end, the, the, uh, tragically, the way it all went down, now there's a nice little spot there, and, and I certainly uh, look forward to supporting that, that business. Pays to, it, it's going to help us all. It's great to see. A um, couple other quick things. One is that the, as a lot of folks know, and I'm sure you know, the transportation bill includes monies for, looks like we're going to get some money, is that correct, for roads? And there's a big message that I'm going to hone down to one word. The citizens would expect you to devote the vast majority of that or a very large amount of that towards surface treatments, towards maintenance. Um, there's a million projects, a million things we could be doing, but that is real critical. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that um, we're, we're no longer having evening meetings on Thursday. Um, now I understand the the Parks District meetings are on Thursday evening, or, or this meeting would be in the evening. And uh, the, the creation of evening meetings uh, happened at a time when we desperately needed some better interaction between the community and the commissioners. So I, I would wonder if, with the feedback I'm getting, how long it'll be before I start collecting signatures so that we put that back on next year's, next year's uh, uh, financing. You know, when we put the budget together next July, we'd probably like to see evening meetings again once a month. So I appreciate your time as always. And uh, again, let's, let's just get real, real serious about what we do with the transportation dollars. It's a can of worms you've inherited, and I wish you the best. Thank you. So a couple of things. One thing is that one of the things we're talking about is a quarterly meeting after we get past this night meeting, after we get past this uh, uh, parks issue. The other is we actually open a separate account for that money right. for maintenance. Right. So uh, our plan is to dedicate that money, which isn't enough, but over time it will help, help a lot. We still need to talk about how we're going to do the shortfall, but but right now our goal is to look at uh, uh, we have a new measurement uh, for road. Uh, quality, and we're going to be looking at that, uh, reassessing that, looking at uh, uh, what our real need is, uh, whether it's 17 million or 100 million a year, and uh, figure that out, and uh, then we're going to come back and start talking about how we fill that gap. So uh, we'll definitely appreciate what they did, but I got to tell you that 205 was not funded. Uh, I, I kind of feel a little bit like Cinderella. We're this beautiful county. We have ugly stepsisters, and we still have not got the money to resolve uh, 205. Uh, but the slipper's off, and now they need to find us and uh, find out, uh, uh, see that the slipper fits, and we need to get 205 funded. So I'm going to call it the Cinderella story. That's that's a good description. and. Um, I'm, I'm not going to hound them the way I hound you folks, but I will make sure that I stay after them. Um, and, and anything we can do to make that number on that display in the back of the room start to, to drop and, and get a hold of this, because I understand we're chasing our friggin' tails here. That's what we're, we're kind of chasing our tail, because we're doing a lot of Band-Aids and we're doing what we can, but in the meantime, if it was a home, it, the foundation's still crumbling, and we keep, we're keep we adjusting the doors and patching the roof and keeping it going, but at some point, if we don't do something with the foundation, it's not going to collapse, but the house is going to be unlivable, and it's going to leak, and then we're going to spend all our time, in my analogy, trying to keep the house patched together because we never got down and fixed the concrete underneath it. So I do appreciate everyone's efforts there, and... and uh, I'll continue to do what I can out in the community and in Salem to try and make it happen. Um, otherwise, Stafford Road is going to become the new 99E from Wilsonville up, up, to, uh, up to nowhere, right? You come up from Wilsonville, you get to Stafford Road in 205, and now where are you? The parking lot. You're still nowhere, yeah. And the Willamette River means that there's no other way through there. So if that corridor doesn't get any attention, we're in trouble. Appreciate Thanks. the extra time. Thanks. Paul?
Yeah, I just want to just add that uh, later I'll talk about tolling in my comments, but uh, coming out of the JPAC meeting this morning and talking about a review of the transportation package that's relevant to this dialogue, I think is, you know, trying to bring attention to the fact that we have uh, not invested in the capacity for our system and, you know, we have some, a few, you know, local elected officials that, you know, view this as, well, we shouldn't build any more roads, cars will be obsolete, um, you know, we should just grind them up and eliminate them and everyone should walk or, or whatnot or in or transit. But, but reality is um, that, you know, there's more and more electric vehicles. There's, Volvo recently announced that they're not going to be producing an internal combustion engine, so they're going all electric, um, it, it appears. Uh, Volkswagen's talking about bringing back the Volkswagen van, but electric powered. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tell people is we need to, we can't ignore or neglect our transportation system, our major, tra and that's what really I think JPAC and the region has a responsibility towards is making sure that our N205 is part of that, um, that the system is there because we're still going to have buses, we're still going to have trucks, and then we're going to be congested with a lot of electric vehicles uh, at some point in the future, or maybe hydrogen vehicles be part of that mix. But the point of the matter is that that infrastructure we have not invested in, and um, we need to. And the same thing goes for our local roads, is that we still need to be able to transport ourselves. And what's lost in all of this is we want to have faster cable service. We want to have faster service to the stores. We want all these things to be faster and faster and faster. And yet our transportation system is getting slower and slower and slower. And that is not what people expect their dollars to go for. It's, it, it, you know, there's our human race, at least in my lifetime, has been on faster, more convenience, more expedient service, and we are not delivering that. Well, I actually had a conversation yesterday with the chairs of Washington County and Multnomah County, and the discussion was around a lot of Multnomah County people don't want to build more roads. Just fixing the road, the bottlenecks, is not building more roads. It's maintaining the system. And uh, if there's one thing that everyone does agree, it is a system. And anything you do on one poor part of that system will affect the, the other part of the system. So for me, toll, if you're considering tolling, great, take a look at it. But you can't just toll 205 because everyone will go I-5 and then it'll be worse. So you got to look at it again as a system. I think Ken... Uh, Ken wants to say something, but I was going to say that Ken uh, reminds me all the time, and everybody else does, that uh, you can't build yourself out of this. You can't build enough roads. Fixing 205 is a temporary fix. Uh, cars that drive themselves someday and you drive down the freeway two inches apart, that's going to help. But uh, that's still a ways out, and I'm not sure I'm ready to buy myself a car that drives by itself. Ken. Well, uh, you, you actually commented pretty closely to what I was going to say. I mean, the bottom line is it's a multimodal transportation system. Um, and you're absolutely right, Paul. Um, you know, there will still be trucks. There will be electric cars. Um, all of that is going to continue even, even as we build more bicycle, even as we build more pedestrian, even as we build more light rail. Um, all of those things need to be done and the roads need to be maintained. It is a true multimodal system and it needs to be faster. You're no, there's no question about it. So it's going to take a major investment on the part of the citizenry and that means taxes. And I know sometimes people don't like to hear that word, but that is the only way we pay for roads is taxes. Now you can call it a toll or you can pay gasoline tax or you can pay vehicle registration fee taxes, or, or you can ask the federal government to give you the money to do it, and maybe they do, but that still came from taxes. And that's how we get the job done. Um, it's highly unlikely that, um, that it's going to be done by private enterprise, though they may be a contributing factor in some areas. But overall, that's what we're going to need to do. And I don't know about anybody else here, but I know my feeling is I do not want to leave a mess uh, for the next generation. I want my children and my grandchildren to be able to have good roads and other modes of transportation so that they can en enjoy their lives, so that they can get to work, so they can get out of, the, out of the city and go camping and all the other things that we like to do and that we take for granted. But in order to do those things, we have to understand that you have to pony up. 
And yeah, it hurts when you write those checks. It hurts when I write mine. But I sure do like driving on a nice smooth road. Yeah, oh. I, I just want to just close with that, this whole thing, and just to at least share this one thing about Monoma County and their needs, their needs are different. Um, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, I ask you to think about where are, where else is there in Oregon? How many places are in Oregon where you have eight lanes? Think about that for a minute. Where do you have eight lanes? And in Multnomah County, right past the Multnomah County building, they have four lanes on Grand Avenue going north, and they have four lanes on Martin Luther King going south. That's an eight, that's an eight lane expressway. They're, they have an established transportation system that is vast, it's large, it's adequate capacity, it doesn't need to be any bigger. They are more, from a transportation infrastructure standpoint, they are more mature and they are built, they're relatively built out and it serves them. So their needs are gonna be different. We just haven't caught up. Okay. That both Washington County and Clackamas County, we need, our, we need our fair share of that, of catching up. Yep, okay, well with that, we'll move on to uh, our public hearings, uh, which is, uh, please join us. Don. Yes, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a public uh, hearing to consider a resolution uh, to approve the Americans with Disability Act transition plan for public rights of way. And we have uh, Mr. Mike Besner and Mr. Steve Williams from our Department of Transportation and Development uh, here to talk with you about this item. Yeah, thanks for having us back. Um, so we are here to talk about our Americans with Disabilities Act uh, transition plan. We were here on May 4th, presented information, got good feedback. Um, basically, the, uh, as a reminder, the transition plan is our plan to get from our current state to full compliance with our sidewalk ramps throughout the county, where we have several thousand. Um, we we um, took the concerns expressed last time and made some edits to the plan, and that's what we're gonna present today and then hopefully uh, um, have the resolution approved. So the changes we made to the plan, um, the first one involved being more specific about the public involvement process we did, and that is on pages seven and eight of the plan um, that we added. And basically we added a section talking about all the groups that we did reach out to and that we did meet with and among others, and they're internal and external to the county, among those internally, several advisory boards, including Disability Services, Senior Services, Developmental Disability, the Clackamas County Bike and Ped Advisory Committee, and, and CPOs. Um, so we added a section in here to be a little more specific about the outreach that we did do. Um, we also, um, last time heard about there should be a process if somebody has a complaint or has a specific, hey, I use this intersection and, and it's not compliant for me. Um, and so we added a section in here as well about that on page eight. Um, and basically we already have a process for dealing with all kinds of complaints throughout the county. And what we're gonna do is be a lot more, uh, make sure people are aware of that. It, it's called our road concerns hotline. It used to be pothole hotline, we've expanded. Um, but it's both email and on the web um, and phone. Anyways, we can take those and what'll happen is it goes into the queue and we'll address it. And, and certainly if somebody's got a great one, then uh, we would respond to it like any other one we get um, throughout the county. So that's in the, that's in the report or in the plan. And then the, probably the most significant one is the timeline, which was um, justifiably a concern. And so we, we added on page 24, what we've been able to do is sharpen our pencils quite a bit, work with our maintenance department, um, and as we pave, we are committed to upgrading the ramps, and we hadn't included that in the previous timeline. Um, so we're estimating that we'll be that way probably every other year as we do paving. Of course, the new money, we haven't, that's not in here yet, so think about that. But probably on average about 50 ramps a year um, get replaced that way and that and in addition we looked at some of the ramps don't need to be replaced they de just need new um, tactile warning the the yellow knobby things you see and those are pretty easy and we could do those pretty quickly so we were able to shorten the timeline that we predict considerably to the point where arterials which of course are our largest most traveled roads and those were priorities one through three if you recall in the in the report and the what was important to the public um, if we solely focused on them, we'd be able to do that in about eight and a half years. 
Um, the collector roads, which were priorities four through six, then could be done in an additional four years. Um, and then the, the, the lower priority, which is basically the local roads and then, frankly, the ramps that don't go anywhere, um, would take another 12 and a half years after that. So it's quite a, it's quite a different timeline. We've already started. Um, we're already underway designing um, the project in the Oak Grove area, actually, where we're going to be replacing a bunch of ramps. And we're already including this work in our next paving packages that are going to go next spring. Um, so um, given those changes, I would say, you know, we respectfully request that you approve the resolution. We can get to work. Um, and do you have any questions? Any questions or comments? I just want to thank Mike, I want to thank you and Steve for um, working with me on this and collaborating and just the wonderful commitment to everyone in our county. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a, it's a better document. <clears throat> uh, I, and I guess I'd like to, and we can talk about this as a strategy too, and, uh, and I don't know what the need is, Clackamas Town Center, 80, 82nd Air, uh, Avenue, uh, areas that the Urban Renewal District still has some money. Um, as we sell off properties in that area, you know, and we dedicate that, which we haven't really talked about that much, to housing, affordable housing, uh, we, we could also dedicate some of those monies to actually stepping up the program in areas uh, like that. When we, again, look at our mapping on the areas that have the greatest need, um, uh, due to poverty or hunger or homelessness, that might be another way to try to focus some of that money. And, and the North Clackamas area is specifically one of those areas. Um, but at the same time, you got to balance gentrification uh, and other issues such as that. So uh, that's when we have our discussion with the development community, uh, and with the citizens on where we go from here, um, I, that should be part of the discussion, how we can reinvest those Clackamas Town Center dollars to uh, build uh, affordable or middle-income housing. Um, anyway, so th those are some discussions we're going to have a pol we're going to start having policy sessions on uh, where we go from here. So uh, I think Ken. I just had a question. Um, as I know you're aware that we're going to get some maintenance funding from, from the state. I've heard. You, you've heard. <laughs> Have you done any preliminary thinking as to what, what those funds might do in terms of accelerating your plan? Um, that's something we're working on. Um, there's obviously, it, it's, it's a good amount of money. Yeah. And, and there's still actually a question of how much it actually is, and we're trying to sort that out too. So sure. trying not to work too fast here, but pre preliminarily, um, as, as just discussed, you know, maintenance, 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 which includes ADA ramps, because again, we can't do the maintenance work without also addressing the ADA ramps. So I don't know what it is, but I know it'll be significant. Will you be coming back towards us uh, with a, a modified plan, especially on the ADA ramps issues, uh, if you are able to accelerate the program? Um, we, we'd have to look at that. I, I mean, we have to modify the plan periodically. How often do we have to do that, Steve? Um, we're supposed to revisit it every two years. Okay. So then I'd say the answer is yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, go ahead. Oh, just a, a comment to Commissioner Humberston. This plan, there's a section that talks about the current state of our resources, which leaves it open for flexibility. So if there is... It's my understanding if there is the ability to move faster, we, we are not restrained. To, oh, God, no. We can go faster. And that some things were in flux when this was written because we didn't have the information from the legislature, and we can work with what we have. Absolutely. The purpose of the plan is for prioritization. Mm -hmm. If more money is put into it, those priorities will be addressed in yeah. the same order. Yeah. Great. But that's also true when you look at that uh, – uh, whatever that is, picture in the back is that uh, we have roads that um, need uh, a lot of work. But if we talk about the Clackamas Town Center urban renewal monies, we might be able to redirect some of those monies that are being considered around 82nd Avenue and stuff uh, 
to uh, other areas, uh, which would still we have the priority because a, a road at 40 million versus 523 million is a big difference. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a good balance. Also, I met with Barb Cartmill um, since we were getting this money, and we have a new rating system on roads. We're going to start a process to relook at the whole thing and then reset our priorities, and we'll have a more solid figure in what our deficit is on transportation. So when we go back to the taxpayers and we talk about uh, perhaps a um, vehicle registration fee, we'll be able to identify that more specifically. So, is Ken. You know, just, just for the public to understand, too, that it's not just about ADA ramps and paving. Uh, when you're talking about road maintenance, it's the brush cutting that has to be done so there's visibility. There's the lines in the middle of the road, the lines on the side of the road, the buttons in the road, the bridges, um, the, the barriers uh, to prevent uh, people going off the road, um, uh, the ditching work that has to be done, um, <coughs> excuse me, the graveling that has to be done on the sides, on the shoulders of roads, all of those things are, our, are all part of the road maintenance program. It isn't just a matter of laying tar. And so, and every one of those things <laughs> costs a lot of money. So just for the public to understand, it isn't just about laying tar, it's about all of those other factors that are involved in, in transportation. Paul. <laughs> Mike, um, could, this is probably the best opportunity I can imagine we'll see, at least to communicate to some folks out there that are be watching this or watching it now, as to what the purpose of that yellow tactile things are and my point is maybe what they're not. I've seen a couple people um, on McLaughlin Boulevard in particular where there's really long wait times for a pedestrian who wants to cross and I've seen them jumping and stomping on those thinking that there is it's a switch yeah. that they think that by stepping oh, that those those things are actually <laughs> buttons and that by so when you see someone out there stomping it's an interesting um, idea, let them uh, we need to let, let them know there's actually a switch on the pole they're supposed to push to make the crosswalk work I hadn't seen that one I hadn't seen that but, wow. but um, uh, so they're, they're not that they're not a switch. <laughs> thank, yeah. thank. That's, that was mainly my point for bringing that up. Yeah. I mean, they are, do you want to again? Uh, yeah, the uh, we call it trunk, truncated dome or, or tactile surface. It's there to provide a texture and color contrast that helps those who are blind or have low vision to recognize where the appropriate location is to cross the road and also to give them a a hazard warning so that they know they're approaching a hazard. The dogs they use are trained to recognize that. Uh, and then those who are low vision can at least see the contrasting color. Uh, the other thing that has, <laughs> the other thing has come up, and, I, and apparently we've done some of this as well, and that's the confusing thing about the people that are um, uh, vision impaired um, is that um, they usually use that as a guide to know which way to go. And apparently we have put in, as opposed to two, mm -hmm. at, let's say we have an intersection that is, yep. you know, 90, 90, 90 degrees. Yeah. Um, we've put in one versus putting in two, which gives the person mm -hmm. who's sight impaired yeah. um, walking towards the middle of the intersection as opposed to walking down the sidewalk. So why did we do that? And is that still, is that still legitimate means or is, it, is the law say now that it's two? Yeah, it's two, and when those were done, one was okay, and now we it, that has changed, and so that's one of the things that is one of the things we're fixing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. I will open the public hearing. Ask, ask if anyone would like to testify on this matter. <laughs> I was going to guess. <laughs> You got to stomp your feet a couple times on the yellow tactile strip <laughs> before you can come up. I'll be quick. Um, just that uh, if, when you get into concrete and asphalt, it is really expensive. And Mike knows that. I'm looking over and I'm smiling at him like, no kidding. Uh, but anything we can do to expedite things now is going to improve safety faster. And, you know, oil prices are pretty tolerable now. And who knows, things can change. And all of a sudden, the price of asphalt and the price of getting it out to the job site and everything else goes up. So, um, and I fully support working together and accomplishing two things at once. 
you hear all the time, uh, especially in the past, where we come in and we fix this, and then we come back and we tear it up and do that. So I don't need to, to reiterate that the public, when they see, oh, wow, you did the whole thing, you did the sidewalks, you did the intersection, it looks great, and then you're not coming out there next year um, and working on it again and creating a disruption. So I, I certainly support this, and uh, I appreciate Paul bringing up the, uh, the, uh, the buttons that people are trying to activate. The very first time I walked across, very first time I walked across the street and saw one of those, I went, "Is this to stop the kids from skateboarding on these things?" Because we're trying to, and, you know, like two days later, I see a obviously a gentleman with a. I see him walk up, and I go, "Okay, <laughs> these are really not to stop skateboarders." But uh, the message there is. While we're improving a lot of things, the signage and public awareness is really important. Um, you know, there's, there's a flashing light in front of the Capitol at the sidewalk. You walk up, you hit the button, it automatically comes on. People are walking out, there's no time delay. Other places, they're always flashing, like at the end of the Bybee Bridge in Portland. And I won't get any more long-winded than that, but we need uniformity. And anything you can do to create uniformity um, is, is for our best interest. So. Glad to move forward on this, and thanks for your time. Great, thank you. Um, the next, uh, with that, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the resolution for the Americans with Disabilities Act transition plan for the public rights of way. Second. It's been moved and second to approve the resolution for the, for the American with Disability Act transition plan for the public right of way. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, opposed? You. Hearing none, motion carries. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the next item. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, this is a public discussion item. It's uh, consideration of approval of a resolution to adopt the 2017 revision to performance Clackamas, which is the uh, Clackamas County Strategic Plan. I have uh, Mr. Dan Chandler, Assistant County Administrator, here to present this item to you. Uh, good morning, Dan Chandler, Assistant County Administrator. As Administrator Krupp said, we're here to present the revision, the 2017 revisions to performance Clackamas, the Clackamas County Strategic Plan. I'm going to be fairly brief, but Performance Clackamas is it's a planning and performance management system that really focuses on the outcomes or results that are achieved by our citizens and our residents and our businesses as a, as a result of our efforts. Rather than focus exclusively on what we do, we're really focusing now on becoming accountable for what the community receives as a result of what we do, and therefore we learn whether we're effective or not. Under Performance Clackamas, every department will develop its, or has developed now, its own strategic business plan that talks about its own strategic issues, sets out its own performance measures for every program, and then can hold people accountable for those results. A couple of highlights on the program. Um, the last Board of Commissioners directed that departments complete their plans by 2018. I'm happy to report that uh, I think as of right now, CECOM is in a retreat to finalize the last of the performance plans for the board-directed departments. So that will be 17 departments that have gone through their highly inclusive uh, and highly detailed planning process. About 40% of our budget is now tied to measurable results. Uh, when H3S gets its uh, budget on board next year and potentially the Sheriff's Office, uh, that number will be substantially higher. I wanted to share, uh, there are a lot of stories we, we could share, but one of them I think is particularly important, and it came up, I think, just yesterday. In 2012, a metro area city received a lot of press coverage for a city council resolution that will require their planning department to turn around industrial design review applications in 60 days or less. And that was felt in the metro context to be a huge deal. To get that done in 60 days, was so unique in the metro area and our land use context that they got a lot of press around that. Um, I want to report now that we complete 90% or more of our industrial, commercial, industrial, commercial, and multifamily design review applications <coughs> in 45 days or less. Uh, we set a target of 60 days and we're just hitting that 100% of the time, so they've now moved the target 
probably as far as it can be moved because you've obviously got to have public process and participation and comments. We're 90% or better at 45 days or less. Also, the notion that we're not going to have a new uh, rating system for roads came out of the performance Clackamas process and talking about how do we best compare our efforts and our results to other jurisdictions. So we're now using a pavement condition index system as opposed to our old system. The final program highlight I want to share is that earlier this month, the International City County Managers Association uh, awarded or recognized Clackamas County with a Certificate of Achievement in Performance Management. To put that in context, there are over 22,000 cities and counties in America. 59 have received those certificates. Now, we have a long way to go. There are three levels of certificates, and we're just now at the first. Um, but that was a significant, I think, recognition from the ICMA that we're at least on the right track. Um, the original plan was adopted in 2014. You recall we were just coming out of the Great Recession. It was a different world then. Three years later, the economic pictures changed. Um, there are new issues facing the community and a new makeup of the Board of County Commissioners. So the Commission had a retreat in uh, March of this year, and we've had a number of policy sessions, meetings with virtually every uh, county department and elected official, um, and we have a new plan that re reflects, I think, the new environment and the new priorities of the Commission. The result of that work is before you today. I won't cover it in detail, but I wanted to address some of the highlights. All of the original 28 goals and areas of focus have all been revised in some form or other. We've looked at them, we've changed the language, we've changed the dates, uh, we've changed the emphasis, so every one of those has been revisited. Um, there is a new section in the plan now of community indicators where we're housing those issues or addressing those issues that are of importance to the community, but where we have a limited level of, of influence. We want to know, for example, how are median incomes in Clackamas County? How do they compare to the rest of the region? So those kinds of things are now in this community indicators section of the plan. There is also a uh, robust set of planning uh, milestones to begin to set out how we provide facilities to serve the public for the coming decades. Over the next five years, we'll be planning a whole lot of things for the future in Clackamas County, the courthouse, um, a safe place, a, number, a jail, a number of those kinds of issues are all going to be planned up. They won't be done soon. In fact, we'll have more, we'll have more to do than we'll be able to do, um, but we'll at least get those plans in place. Um, and along with a continued focus on economic development, the new plan is an increased focus on poverty and food insecurity, clearly a reaction to the state, uh, the state of our economy and the state of our community today. We're going to designate equity pilot areas, and along with our partners, bring to bear a coordinated focus strategy to improve people's lives. We're going to include economic development, uh, workforce, all of our health, housing, and human services efforts. We're going to look at these areas and really come together and figure out how we can move the needle for poverty and food insecurity in those communities. And then we're going to learn things that we can apply to the rest of the county as well. And finally, I think, is a directed focus on housing affordability with specific targets for development of new affordable units, both by the public and private sectors. Um, this is going to work in tandem with efforts by C4 and the rest of our partners in the community. So those are the, really the two big new initiatives that have come out of this plan. So a results-based st strategic plan represents your marching orders to us, your staff, and the, you know, the county's commitment to the community to say what we're going to do and be accountable for the results that we achieve. We believe the plan before you does those things and recommend its adoption. Thank you. Great. And Don, I think this would be an appropriate time for you to mention what we talked about this, this morning from Jim Marks at Greater oh, Portland, Inc. Oh, gosh, sure, yeah, that was part of my uh, <coughs> good news, but this is an example of the kind of thing that I think is uh, a result of us paying close attention to our performance measures and having good, clear goals about what performance means for serving the citizens of Clackamas County. So uh, I, I got this note from Gary Barth, who is our Director of Business and Community Services. Uh, he was attending a Greater Portland, Inc., board uh, meeting uh, when uh, Jim Mark of Melvin Mark Development, a pretty large uh, development company, um, told the director of Portland Prosper, which is uh, uh, formerly known as the Portland Development Commission, and this was shared in front of the entire board of directors for uh, Greater Portland, Inc., uh, that uh, he was able to get through the Clackamas County permitting process for project uh, in Clackamas uh, in 10 days it took him to do this work. 
Uh, and uh, he expressed that uh, had he been working in the city of Portland, and this is not to be disparaging to the city of Portland, but to, to draw a comparison, it, a project like this might take five months uh, to, to get permitted. He said uh, Clackamas was easy to work with uh, and was rational and practical uh, with regard to his project. So I mean, it's just a fabulous job on the part of our uh, staff over at transportation and development, particularly the permitting and planning staff and, and the engineering group as well. So, um, And having spent a couple of decades in the development industry, uh, it's hard to overestimate the importance of that. Those things get coffee shopped and shared around beers. And development decisions are often, um, you know, personal. They're made off the cuff, and folks decide developers, these are people deciding where they're going to go. And the fact that there is less hassle and less time in one jurisdiction over another, it makes a, tr I've seen it for decades, it makes a tremendous difference. And it's gonna help us on economic development efforts, and it's gonna help us on affordable housing efforts. If folks wanna go where there's less, there's less hassle. Um, a couple things I wanna note, thanks to uh, Commissioner Fisher for pointing out the, the heading, um, uh, uh, the very last page, honor, invest, and utilize natural resources. There are three bullets there uh, related to crime rate. Those should be under safe, healthy, and secure communities. We'll move them. I would also note that there were footnotes uh, in the plan. There are footnotes in the plan that were important to the commission in gaining consensus around the meaning of some of those measures. They're not in this document as well. Um, uh, Ryan Johnson has been working on his on vacation. but we'll, we'll add the footnotes back in, and we will change those three bullets uh, in the final document. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Savas. <clears throat> you know, in looking at this, Dan, um, the uh, seven, eight pages here, um, it occurred to me that um, what ought to have some emphasis and maybe, or maybe be better spelled out or spelled out period because really we barely really touch on it is, and it's related, it's related to housing and getting people into um, out of poverty and so forth is jobs. We, we seem to lost the emphasis on jobs, at least, at least in, this, in these seven pages. I know we talk about it a little bit, um, but as I peruse this front to back several times here, um, I, I think we need something that really speaks to, speaks to that and also speaks to the types of jobs we need that um, particularly are going um, unserved or not growing at the fastest rate. There's a lot of jobs or high tech, high skill, that we seem to be doing a pretty good job, or in the regions doing a pretty good job of having those job opportunities. But some of the uh, typical uh, lower skill, higher paid jobs, and that block of folks who are unemployed or underemployed and not part of the numbers um, aren't really represented in this document. So maybe uh, the, we um, talk about that as well. Um, I know that we're going to have, hopefully, a, another opportunity to. Um, circle back on a retreat, um, on the closing aspects of a retreat to maybe go over a few of these things. Um, but that's one I want to just bring to our attention this morning. So what's, it, what's in the plan now, um, Commissioner? There are three, I believe, three bullets. By 2019, 80% of the jobs created in the Clackamas County by employers receiving direct taxpayer support will be annual living wage jobs. And under the community indicators, we say job growth in Clackamas County should meet or exceed the original average. And then another bullet says annual wages earned in Clackamas County should be at or above the, the statewide average. And I would note that this plan is your plan, and we can revise it. We can adopt it now and add measures and revise it next month or three months or next year. So this, isn't, this, is, a living, this is a living document, and it's your, and it is your document. Yeah, I, I guess I used the, the simplistic uh, conversation I had with uh, a person who has found himself homeless uh, as a result of his rent doubling. And I said, well, so what do you think would be a reasonable rent in today's age? He goes, right now it doesn't matter. I don't have a job. So even if the rent was $100 a month, I don't have $100 a month. So I think it speaks to the job with the need for jobs. Thank you. Yeah, I think at the same time, I mean, uh, one thing that's driving me a little bit crazy is that, that now it's no longer homelessness, it's campers. That, that's amazing. Uh, I don't know about you, but I go camping at a lake. Uh, I don't camp in the forest uh, around the city. Uh, it's not a vacation. I mean, I, I don't know. 
I, I, I hear that nationally, and it's been recent. Like in the last couple of months, it's turned to camping rather than homelessness. Just yesterday, I heard a report on that. Sonia. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that I like our overarching policy of growing a vibrant economy. And I think it's important for us to keep the perspective as a county government, we work with market forces. And where we have impact as a county government is in any incentives that we provide to attract employers to our community or any land that we may have that we can facilitate and what types of jobs are there. But what, what other things that we do is we are collaborators and we work with workforce, we work with our community colleges, we work with our high schools. One thing that this overarching goal does is it says we need li living wage jobs. We need jobs that can actually pay the rent. And that allows us in our work that we do with all of our community partners to keep that as a focus. And I feel that in my communications with the rest of us, with my fellow commissioners and with our staff, that we are working to do that. That that is, we understand that the, we, our economy is recovering, our unemployment rate is low, and the middle jobs, which are just now starting to make a recovery, that that is our focus. So I really appreciate Commissioner Savas bringing that to our attention and not just looking to create jobs in general, but again, those jobs that pay the bills. We need to do our focus there. And I think that our overarching policy allows us the flexibility to do that. Great. Um, Ken. <clears throat> Teddy Roosevelt said it over 100 years ago. He said it best. It's not about a minimum wage. It's about a living wage. And unfortunately, we, have, we are building an economy based on as cheap a labor as you can get away with. And that is not sustainable. So <clears throat> whatever we can do, not only to encourage businesses who come here um, to be businesses that pay a living wage, but also what we could do to consider how we raise the minimum wage locally is something that ought to be looked at. Uh, they did it in Seattle, and the numbers are outstanding. The economy there is growing like crazy. They have a 2.6% uh, um, uh, um, unemployment rate, which is almost unheard of in, in a modern economy. Um, <clears throat> so in the final analysis, we don't have as many manufacturing jobs uh, as we used to have because they've either gone overseas or technology has replaced them. You know, promises to bring back the coal industry, as some have made, isn't going to happen because those jobs are being mechanized. Um, so we need to look at the service industries, which is where the bulk of the lower wage jobs are, and do what we can to encourage those wages to go up. That's the bottom line. That's, that's where more and more people are going to be working, is one kind of service industry another. And if they are not making a living wage, then we will be paying taxes to subsidize their living, either to help them buy food or buy roofs over the head or pay their bills. And when we do that, we help large corporations paying very low wages make bigger profits. And that does not help the working and middle class of this country. And Commit I'll Commissioner Savas. Well, it's a very, the economics is a very complex thing, but I will say just to build on what um, Commissioner Fisher alluded to as far as businesses and incentives. Um, I don't necessarily think that sometimes businesses locate here or relocate elsewhere uh, due to an incentive or a lack of incentive, um, direct incentive, let's say from government, let's say, as, as some kind of a subsidy. I think it's more sometimes about, number one, um, you know, does the transportation system work? Do I have the infrastructure? Or for better yet, can my employees afford to live here? Or can I can still afford to live here? And now they have to live maybe in... Salem or Woodburn and drive into the Portland region to get to work. That's, those are the kinds of things that if our area becomes unaffordable because of certain market forces within, uh, land values going up or transportation systems not being developed, and we heard this from the China delegation as well when they come up here about a year and a half ago, um, their issue, well, they were astonished. And even some of the investments they made here on how the poor condition of our infrastructure and the level of service that is not there that they have elsewhere. 
So those are some indirect incentives. They're incentives, but they're not direct incentives. So I wanna, at least I, I want to advocate that I think those are the things that I hear directly from businesses that have chosen to go elsewhere, Washington State, for example, um, and other areas um, that, you know, there are things that are very critical to the workforce and to trans moving goods and services to make those businesses thrive or suffer in this case. Absolutely. I just want to add something that actually I just heard yesterday that Seattle's reevaluating their wage increase because it's actually showing a loss in jobs. I, it, that, but there, there's a um, particular group that is looking at one very small segment of, the, of industry, and it's the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. And there's a combination of other factors involved there, part of which is saturation. Mm -hmm. But um, if you talk to someone or listen to someone like Nick Hanauer, who is a multi-billionaire centered in, in Seattle, um, the information that, that uh, he is putting forward uh, says quite the opposite. It, it, and um, to, just to give you another example, uh, in the state of Wisconsin, I think it was rated as having the third highest taxing uh, uh, rates on business of any state in the union. It was also considered by CNBC a year ago to be the best state in the nation to do business. And the reason is exactly what Mr. Savas said. In, in investment of those tax dollars in infrastructure and an educated and trained workforce. Yeah, well, uh, first off, I, I totally support increasing minimum wages. It should be a federal minimum wage. Then you would have less of this going on. Yeah. So, uh, However, and uh, as Oregon doing is that it's, it's a slow increase, yeah. much more rapid than what would probably normally happen, but it's still slow. But jumping from 9 to 15. You can't do it in one jump. Yeah, it's a huge impact. But again, the federal government, if they did it on federal minimum wage, it would be a lot better thing, uh, process to do. But Anyway, boy, we're having some good talks today. <laughs> Waxing <laughs> philosophical. It's almost today. time for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So uh, this is a—is this a public hearing? Discussion item. Okay. Yes, just a discussion item. So, any other questions or comments? So I'll entertain a motion. Well, Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the resolution adopting the 2017 revision to performance Clackamas, the Clackamas County Strategic Plan. Second. We moved and second to approve a resolution adopting the 2017 revision uh, to the performance Clackamas, the Clackamas County Strategic Plan. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Next item on the agenda is a consent agenda. Okay. Um, the consent agenda under health, housing, and human services, approval of agreement with Clackamas Women's Services for Shelter Advo Advocacy, Crisis, Training, and Rural Domestic Violence Services, approval of the revenue, Renewal Revenue Agreement with Oregon Health and Science University for the Cocoon Program, approval of Amendment Number 11 for the Professional, Technical, and Personal Services Agreement with Oregon Community Health Information Network, for Practicing Management Systems Agreement for the EPIC software, approval of an amendment to the intergovernmental agreements between participating cities and Clackamas County for requalification as an urban county, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the State of Oregon Housing and Community Services Department to administer Community Resource Division funds, approval of a professional services agreement amendment number one with folk time for peer service support services for the Riv Riverstone Crisis Clinic for the Safety Net Program, approval of a professional services agreement amendment number one with folk time for peer support services for Clackamas County Sheriff's Office Behavioral Health Unit, Approval of a professional service agreement, amendment number two with NAMI, National Association of Mentally Ill of Clackamas County. Approval of a revenue intergovernmental agreement with Washington County for a regional prevention coordinator for fiscal year 17-18. Under the Department of Transportation and Development, approval of the first addendum to the intergovernmental agreement between Clackamas County and the city of Malala relating to building code services. 
Under finance, approval of a contract with Soderstrom Architects for the OSU Extension Service Building Project. Under elected officials, approval of previous business meeting minutes. Under county council, approval of a resolution authorizing the county administrator to adopt a HIPAA policy and appoint HIPAA officers. Under business and community services, approval of a modification of grant and cooperative agreement with the Bureau of Land Management, Oregon Washington BLM, for the dump stopper program. Approval of amendment and restatement of an interim agreement by and among Metro, the City of Oregon City, Clackamas County, and Rediscover the Falls, an Oregon nonprofit public benefit corporation. Under juvenile, uh, approval of a personal services contract, amendment number two, and renewal number seven, number, I'm sorry, amendment number seven and a rule and renewal number four with the Boys and Girls Aid Society to provide shelter services to youth. Approval of a personal services contract, amendment number seven and renewal number four with Christian Community Placement Center to provide shelter services to youth. Approval of a personal services contract, amendment number seven and renewal number four with Parrot Creek Child and Family Services to provide uh, shelter services to youth and uh, acceptance of a grant award from the Bureau of Land Management, Financial Assistant Opportunity, BLM Oregon Washington Youth Services, Clackamas County, Oregon. Oh, and that concludes the consent agenda. Great, uh, does any commissioner wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Um, I just, I had a comment. Uh, one is that I was at a meeting yesterday and um, with the chairs of Multnomah and Washington County, and it would be great if I had a little more information on shelters in Clackamas County, whether adults or adults or juvenile, because I don't really know that. Mm -hmm. I of course know about Parrot Creek, and I know about some of the various ones, but I'm not that familiar with what opportunities we have in Clackamas County for shelters. So uh, very little. Yeah, um, well, that's there, what I thought. I yeah. I almost said we have none, but. But we do have some. Yeah, actually, I was surprised that they're actually numerous, but they're small. Yeah. So I think collectively, if I recall, it's about a we, the our ability is capacity was about a hundred something um, in totality. So names and capacities might be. Yeah, we've got an inventory you can provide. I'm sure you do. Uh, and and that was my understanding is that we have very few shelters. Multnomah County has quite a few, and obviously Washington County has some, but I have no idea what we have, so anyway. Well, with that, uh, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and second to approve the consent agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Thank you, and on to the county administrator updates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple of items. Uh, one is uh, we uh, learned that our health centers division of our health, housing, and human services department was recently notified that it uh, met or exceeded the performance target on each of our uh, metrics for incentives for uh, 2016 from uh, Family Care Health. This is the coordinated care organization we receive funding from. Uh, in, uh, in all, there were five metrics that our health centers were scored on. They included access, colorectal cancer screening and intervention, alcohol, drug screening and intervention, uh, emergency department utilization and uh, data accuracy. And this achievement uh, means that we can expect to see more funding in the future uh, from Family Care Health. And it really uh, recognizes the great work of our health centers staff to engage uh, with and provide medical care uh, for vulnerable populations. So great job to our staff. Uh, the other item I have for you, and again, I, I, I just continue to get very nice notes involving our Transportation and Development Department. This uh, from uh, Patricia. She recently had filled out a um, road concern online form to let us know about blackberry bushes uh, that were overhanging onto one of our roads. And three days later, we received a very nice note from her saying, thank you for the 
amazingly quick response. Uh, we came home this morning and there was a county guy mowing down the blackberries. Man, uh, I call that service. We gave him a thumbs up as we drove by and big smiles. Thanks again. So I wanted to thank Patricia for sharing that uh, with us and also um, thank our truly wonderful transportation staff. And I'd like to remind folks that anyone who has a question or a concern about uh, county road, uh, potholes, brush, uh, or other problems are encouraged to contact our county uh, road concerns by emailing road concerns, that's one word, road concerns, uh, at uh, clackamas.us or calling at 503-557-6391. And of course, we also have a form online that folks uh, can access to file uh, through our, uh, our website at www.clackamas.us forward slash transportation and then you click on road concerns and you get right to there. So great job, uh, transportation and development. Thanks. Great, thank you. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I'm just gonna just dedicate this time to talk a little bit about tolling because as I mentioned on Tuesday at our work session, uh, I knew that'd be a discussion uh, both this morning and yesterday morning. And it continues to be, we had a uh, speaker or a public comment this morning um, at JPAC, Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation. And um, this person was speaking to, actually asking us, who, where'd this tolling come from? You know, um, did you guys decide this? And, you know, the obvious occurred to me, which has occurred to me before, but that he wasn't aware of how complex our decision-making process is in Oregon, especially the metro region, on how and who decides on what transportation facilities are built capacity, whether it's highways or transit systems and so forth. And so he was clearly not understanding and presuming that we, that body, uh, made that determination when yet the transportation bill and the tolling he was referring to was the legislature. So, um, but as it relates to tolling, um, the point I made, which was um, Councillor uh, Bob Stacy had um, uh, built on my comments and uh, which seemed to be in a relative agreement was, that you know, we are not, we need to present a value proposition. What benefit do I have for tolling? Why are we tolling? And why are we tolling only these facilities or whatnot? I mean, there's, there's a myriad of questions and, and we don't really don't know exactly what the bill means. And I think that we'll have a lot of discussion if it takes us a year and a half, because that's what the bill says. The, the legislative bill 2017-10, states that by December of next year, 2018, we ODOT is required to have a plan or a s proposal for tolling, uh, to whether to do it, not do it, how to do it, why to do it, and all those good things. So in the meantime, we're gonna have a lot of dialogue, and I think it's not gonna be very constructive. It just adds to the uncertainty as to what our future is. And, um, you know, it was suggested earlier in the presentation as it relates to the tolling that, oh, well, we're doing this because of, you know, maybe carbon dioxide contribution to the climate and so forth. And I said, well, you know, the part that's lost in all this is that it may be in 10 or 20 years, um, we have very few internal combustion engines contributing CO2 that are out there on the roads. And again, as I mentioned earlier, Volvo announcing it's not going to build any more internal combustion engines more electric vehicles being out there. The writing's on the, writing is on the wall that, that vehicles as we know them today that we get here are gonna be a fuel other than um, or powered by electricity, uh, things that are not contributing um, CO2 to, the, to that. So, but we'll still have a, a system, infrastructure, uh, inadequate infrastructure in order to handle the capacity. I think for every value prop, for everything that you charge someone for, there should be a value proposition. So what what would the tolling buy? What do I get for the tolling? And if we don't improve some of that traffic flow in those areas and we just basically deliver a broken, undersized, undercapacity system and then start charging for that, um, I think we're going to have taxpayer revolt. Um, and uh, so that was my, my, uh, my point this morning that we have not demonstrated, uh, we don't know. We didn't, we, Clackamas County, didn't promote the tolling. Um, you know, which counties or which jurisdictions are, are seen to be having the loudest voice right now and being um, impacted or feel that they could be impacted. It's not Washington County. Um, and to some degree, it doesn't even seem to be Multnomah County. It seems to be Clark County, Clackamas County that would 
re really rely upon I-205 is as one of our corridors to get from one part of our county to another part of our county, um, whereas very little of I-5, for example, and especially 205 goes in and out of Washington County. So I think that the sooner we settle this, um, and I, I'm going to encourage ODOT to um, uh, accelerate their study and to try to expedite that in a way that uh, we have a result sooner because I don't think it's going to be a um, uh, being viewed very positively um, without solutions and a year and a half of anguishing over this and discussing it without any answers, without clarity, is not a recipe for success in building, number one, an understanding, number two, does it make us look good we can't answer the question, uh, or anyone else answer the questions. There's just too many, there's too much uncertainty, not enough questions answered, and it certainly didn't come from Clackamas County. So that's what I have to talk about, and I mentioned I would share that on Tuesday with you all, so that's my report. Great. Kent? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, recently had an opportunity to meet with the, the governor at a, an event, and I was able to um, briefly uh, discuss uh, a favorite subject of mine, cross-laminated timber, and we will have an appointment with her expert in her offices uh, to further those discussions. Uh, she is informed on the subject and was interested in, in uh, pursuing it, so looking forward to, to uh, hopefully enlisting a more aggressive support from the governor's office on this issue. Um, in about two weeks, there will be a contingent coming from China to our county, and at least for one day of it, it would appear that I will be uh, squiring them around on behalf of the commission. So look, I'm looking forward to that. A um, lot to learn there. March, Martha's going to be out of town, so she's asked me to, to take this one on, and, and so that'll be a learning experience. Um, yesterday, went to two events. One was um, at the um, uh, Oregon State University Extension offices there near Charbonneau for their open house. Good food and um, um, events uh, at the at the thing is showing. You know, excuse me, um, what's the, showcasing is the word I was looking for. Showcasing some of the things that they do on behalf of the agricultural community. Uh, everything from dealing with pests and bugs to um, hybrid, hybridizing uh, different plants and products. Um, as you probably are aware, we have over 240 um, crops that are grown uh, in this region, and what they do is, is valuable for our agricultural community, which produces literally hundreds of millions of dollars worth of uh, income and uh, jobs in our community. And then the second opportunity, uh, briefly, was to go with Chair Bernard to um, Clackamas Community College, where uh, Irene Konev was sworn in as a new member of the Clackamas Community College Board, and it was a pleasure to see her there. I think she will bring a much-needed voice uh, to their board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great dog. Oh, the dog, yes. Thank you. Always the dogs. Always the dogs, yes. And this is Puck. He will immediately wiggle his way into your lap and heart. He is a shy guy that will need some extra TLC until he gets to know you. He is looking for an adult-only home because he can get nervous around a lot of activity or noise. He is easily intimidated by other dogs, so he'll need to be your one and only. This three-year-old Chihuahua has lots of love to give and continues to grow more confident each day. Please come on down and meet Puck if you are ready to journey together. For more information about Puck and other adoptable dogs, please contact Clackamas County Dog Services at 503-655-8628 or www.clackamas.us forward slash dogs. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, just a couple things I want to share. I had the wonderful opportunity of taking a tour with Brian Johnson, who is here testifying before us on a list of his concerns. And I so enjoyed my afternoon with him. We had a list of issues. We're going to be working with our staff to, to look into them. But overall view, so for those that don't know, Brian Johnson is the grandson of, his, of the Johnson City, the founder of Johnson City, which is the smallest city. I don't know how big it is, but I didn't know much about Johnson City when I went on this tour, and we started at one end of Johnson City, and we finished in 
not even minutes, I think, as we drove past Johnson <laughs> City. So it's uh, manufactured homes. He had some really, we're always looking, I know all of us and all of our conversations are always talking about housing affordability. He's got some really good ideas. He does a lot of um, work around the county. He manages properties. He repairs the properties and maintains the ones that he has. He knows a lot about engineering. He was really insightful on different costs of housing and was we're looking at the property in Clackamas for transitional housing. He had some ideas there. I just want to applaud citizen involvement and taking time, his taking time to talk with me and just all the ideas that are generated. I think it's a really, really positive conversation. And then another, I'm still continuing going out in all of our communities, spent some time with John Meyer, who is head of the Hamlet in Milano, did an entire tour of the area. And some of the um, major concerns, of course, is roads, road safety, very, very serious, um, going through the, with an individual who drives these roads every day and looking at the lack of visibility and where there are the major concerns and whether there have been fatalities. It's, it's very eye-opening. Um, we don't have control over all of the roads because so much of the challenges are owned, they're ODOT and they're state, state highways. But I know that we coordinate and collaborate and I really applaud our folks in transportation for doing that. I don't know if people know, but there is a landslide. Does everybody know this or is this just new to me? There is a landslide in Milano. There are two, I've learned this, there are two types of landslides. There are some that can be repaired and some that just keep moving. This is one that can, is going to continue to keep moving. The road that has been affected by the landslide, if you drive down 213, is being repaired as we speak. We're working with, just to give information, to John for the Hamlet to say, what is the involvement? We have part of the road. We have a county road that's affected by the landslide. The state has, we have, there's a lot of houses that are on the hillside affected by the landslide. So we're looking into that. Overall, always when we go out to the community, the changes in the community, the agricultural um, assets of the community are discussed in Malino. We've got some hay, we've got lots of horses. We got some Christmas trees. There has been talk of um, some nursery owners having difficulty with workforce. There um, is always the issue of marijuana. It is there, but there hasn't been any issues that have rise to the level of concern in regards to land use planning, according to John Meyer, who is head of the hamlet there. Some interesting thoughts about community, always looking at where are the community assets. And in Malino, which is just next to Malala, their school district is run as the Malala School District. And they still have their elementary schools in Malino, but there is talk about closing those schools in Malino. And that's a real concern for breaking down community because now the schools that are in Malino are a hub for the community and there's a, just a concern with those if there is consolidation and if that those schools go away. So some of, some of the thoughts and concerns for Malino and I will continue to share my adventures as I make my way around the county and I'm just about getting done with it. It's been um, a good process connecting up with folks. Great, thank you very much. So uh, I also went to NRAC, uh, they had great berry samples. I am uh, actually have put in the polls to start a new line of berries on my property and uh, got some good ideas yesterday. And I uh, had an opportunity to taste a lot of great berries. Um, I wanted to thank Dan Chandler for his presentation today and Mike Besner. Uh, I think we're doing a good job. Uh, I thought that Mike worked really well with you to come up with a plan that didn't take the next 50 years to do. And uh, we still have a long way to go, but I think that over time, uh, maybe greater assets, we can get that done. Um, I, I, I mentioned that I had lunch with the, mayor, the chairs of Washington Multnomah County, and uh, Washington County uh, actually is doing really good on maintenance. Their vehicle registration fee kicked in if they didn't get enough from the legislature. They did not. So it is kicking in. So they will be uh, raising their vehicle registration fee. And uh, they have other um, road maintenance monies that uh, would be nice to have. 
Uh, we got to really seriously think about what we're going to do in the future. Um, I also, uh, yesterday at GPI, we had a presentation from Business Oregon, uh, and uh, they talked a little bit about our rural communities in Oregon, and it's probably the first time I've ever actually heard him say at least five times how important tourism is uh, in Oregon. Uh, some of these rural communities where there's logging is not going to be going on anymore uh, are struggling to f get something going in their community and have tried everything without success. Uh, so a lot of them are focusing on tourism. Some of that's, you know, the old gold mines, the old uh, uh, quartz mines, uh, the old hotels and the history and rodeos and all those things that, uh, uh, you know, they're utilizing those uh, historical assets to draw people to the community. And of course, I've got to remind people that it's, it's not uh, more than a couple of weeks here we have a solar, total solar eclipse uh, that will draw millions of people to Oregon. Oregon is the best place to see it. Can we schedule more of those? Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about doing that. There's a lot of fear, but you know, there there's a lot of people of course taking advantage of this. A lot of the communities uh that are have the best view uh expect millions of people and are trying to worry about transportation, water, uh damage, traffic. Uh so if you're going to go to watch the total solar eclipse in Bend, you should leave today, but you're not going to find a place to watch it. You pull off the freeway, I guess. But Clackamas County will have a good view. Actually, Timothy Lake uh, is a, a really good site to be because it's right in line with the total eclipse. Um, but we're, we're preparing for it, too, as much as we can, since we're not going to. There will definitely be a traffic impact in Clackamas County. So uh, remember uh, to plan ahead and be safe. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about our small grant program. Uh, the goal of small grant program is to assist organizations whose purpose is to help the most vulnerable residents of Clackamas County. The focus is to fund small projects that would aid these entities in better serving their target population. These projects shall demonstrate the ability to become fully self-supporting or shall illustrate that the grant request is for a one-time expense. These programs support agencies that are making an effort to develop, implement, and implement innovative projects that would address the following goals. Help the most vulnerable families, seniors, and others needs that uh, um, meet their basic needs such as food assistance and abuse prevention. Uh, priority will be given to projects regarding food, housing, and homeless prevention. For more information, oh, the applications are due uh, August 21st, 2017 by 5 p.m. For more information, call 503-655-8261 or email, email Carolyn Hill at clackamas.us. You can also visit the website, which is on the screen. We have $250,000, uh, and I don't, we don't necessarily have a limit, do we? We do have a limit. I can't quite remember what that is, but uh, uh, everyone gets a fair shake, and we look at uh, what works best, and... Uh, Occasionally, we help organizations who have gotten grants in the past but are, uh, are continuing to grow and becoming more and more self-sufficient. And we have had got money back from people who uh, couldn't proceed with their grants. But I uh, appreciate uh, this opportunity to uh, help out where we can. And the board has committed uh, for the last few years in our budget $250,000. So with that, um, I think that's it. We will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much for coming.